Ele sunt tot timpul alături de noi. Sunt alături de noi când stăm la un semafor și ne hotărâm dacă să trecem pe verde sau pe roșu. Sunt tot ele alături de noi atunci când ne hotărâm dacă ne împăcăm cu cel mai bun prieten sau nu. Și tot ele, valorile, sunt prezente alături de noi atunci când luăm o decizie de carieră sau poate de școală. Tot ele, valorile, sunt cele care ne ghidează în momente poate de răscruce sau în momente în care povestea noastră stă să se scrie. Mă bucur că suntem împreună ca să discutăm despre ele, despre valori și despre integritate și mă bucur foarte mult să vă spun bună dimineața și bun venit la conferința Bucharest Integrity Gathering și o să vă invit să vă dați pentru început o rundă de aplauze dumneavoastră că sunteți în această sală în această zi de luni. Bine ați venit! Numele meu este Florin Ghinda și sunt gazda dumneavoastră pentru ziua de astăzi. Și pentru că am spus deja de două ori dumneavoastră, îmi vine să vă întreb, nu e mai simplu să ne spunem cu numele mici, cu prenume? Cum preferați? Nume mici să fie. De fapt, să nume mari, dar ne putem adresa mai uh, informal, suntem de altfel într-un spațiu destul de prietenos. Uh, sunt gazda voastră, cum spuneam. Timpul uh, în care o să petreceți împreună cu mine este destul de limitat. Vă țin un pic de povești acum, maxim uh, 10 minute de dimineață, după care voi avea plăcerea să introducem împreună invitații zilei de astăzi. Dar ca să dăm drumul conferinței, avem nevoie de un pic de încălzire. Și pentru că v-am spus deja numele meu, o să vă invit la un prim exercițiu de cunoaștere, toți cu toți, și să vedem dacă va funcționa. Și nu ne ia foarte mult, e vorba de 10 secunde. O să vă rog să vă gândiți la un prenume pe care îl aveți. Mâna sus cine are două prenume? Destul de mult, excelent. Atunci o să vă rog să vă gândiți la unul dintre ele pe care îl preferați. Uh, și o să facem așa, exercițiu scurt, cum spuneam, o să vă spun și eu cel de-al doilea prenume al meu și după ce îmi spun al doilea prenume al meu, o să vă invit pe voi, pe toată lumea, să spuneți în același timp numele. Și facem o probă după care varianta reală. Încercăm? Deci, pe mine mă mai cheamă și Toma, pe voi vă cheamă? Alex. E bine pentru prima probă. Încercăm și proba 2 un pic mai tare, mai ales cei care au băut cafea deja de dimineață, sau ceai, ca să nu fim doar cu cafea. Deci, pe mine mă mai cheamă și Florin și Toma, pe voi vă cheamă? Mă bucur de cunoștință, iată că măcar cu vocea ne-am trezit. Bun, acum, ca să continuăm cu partea asta de cunoaștere, o să vă invit să vă uitați un pic stânga-dreapta sau față-spate, pe rândurile pe care stați acum, în scaunele voastre, și să identificați o persoană pe care nu o cunoașteți. Preferabil nu foarte îndepărtată. Acum, dacă se întâmplă să fie o persoană care vă ieși simpatică, e treaba voastră, ca să zic așa. Și dacă ați identificat acea persoană, o să vă rog să, cu ocazia asta facem și un pic de mișcare, o să vă rog să mergeți la acea persoană și să-i strângeți mâna, să faceți cunoștință și pe lângă schimbul de nume, o să vă rog să întrebați și care e o curiozitate pentru care ați venit astăzi la această conferință. Întrebați această curiozitate și la rândul vostru dați și voi această curiozitate. Și avem 30 de secunde la dispoziție, să vedem. Deci, hai să vedem cum vă cunoașteți și aflați curiozități unii de la ceilalți. <laughs> Excelent! Și curiozitatea, de ce am venit? Sper că nu ne-a luat nimeni cu forța la această conferință. Mai avem încă oameni care nu vorbesc, așa că identificați-vă o pereche, ca să zic așa. Bun. Excelent, mulțumesc frumos. E, acum vine momentul, mulțumesc mult. Desigur că o să puteți continua partea de cunoaștere și în pauze și de ce nu și în timpul sesiunilor. Vine momentul în care vreau să vă spun o mică surpriză. Uh, sunteți pregătiți să auziți surpriza? E bine, surpriza este că nu este genul de conferință în care vor fi niște oameni în față și noi o să stăm acolo pe scaune în întuneric, deși acum, într-adevăr, e un pic întuneric în sală, ci este mai degrabă o invitație pentru a discuta între noi. E un dialog. 
Și ca să facem acest prim exercițiu, o să vă rog să auzim care sunt primele cinci curiozități de la cinci curajoși care ne spun, domnule, pentru ce am venit astăzi la această conferință. Și cred că se aude și fără microfon. Dacă ne spuneți într-un cuvânt, așa, două cuvinte, care sunt cinci curiozități? Fie ale voastre, fie ceva ce ați auzit în sală. Cu alte cuvinte, de ce ați venit azi aici? Pam, 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 pam. Ia să vedem. Facem ca la concert, că și așa cânta Robbie Williams mai devreme. Încercăm cu partea asta din sală. De ce ați venit? Pentru noi experiențe, mulțumesc frumos, ne spui și un nume? Ne bucurăm, mulțumim. Acum trebuie să echilibrăm și cu partea asta din sală. Pentru, voi pentru ce ați venit? Dezvoltare personală să fie. Hai să mai auzim și din partea asta, că am zis 5 top. Mm -hmm. Antrenament. Antrenament. Adevărul că avem niște saci de box, dar nu știu dacă... De fapt am venit cu bicicleta, pot să o pun la dispoziție dacă e nevoie. Și de aici, altceva, dezvoltare personală, antrenament, noi experiențe și... Curiozitate, de ce nu? Apropo de întrebarea, care e curiozitatea? Păi curiozitatea e răspunsul, deci e, e foarte simplu. O să spun un pic mai tare, că sper că a auzit toată lumea. Curiozitatea de a vedea dacă integritatea înseamnă lucruri diferite pentru oameni diferiți sau dacă nu cumva e vorba de același lucru. Mulțumesc frumos pentru răspunsurile voastre. Dacă mai vrea cineva bonus să ne spună o altă curiozitate sau un element pentru care a venit, este invitat să o facă. Dacă nu, o să vă spun și câteva informații tehnice să le spunem. Ați primit deja de la voluntarii de la intrare câteva hârtii cu câteva informații și un creion. O să le folosim pe parcursul zilei, iar la finalul zilei avem și o surpriză legată de una din acele hârtii. Probabil că ați văzut deja textul scris acolo. Recunosc că eu parcă totuși aș mai provoca un pic de mișcare în sală, că parcă e prea simplu. Așa doar răspundem și ne spunem numele. Vă mai propun un ultim exercițiu fizic, după care promit să nu vă mai chinui cu exerciții fizice. O să facem tot așa pe sală. Uh, ieri mă gândeam cum am putea să ne trezim de dimineață și mi-a venit în minte acest semn. A ce arată? Hmm? 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 Nu știu ce arată. <laughs> uh, vă propun ca această sală să repetați acest semn. Este băul din big. Ia să vedem cum arată bull din big. Excelent, excelent. Cu partea de sus a corpului ne-am trezit. Mulțumesc! Uite că partea asta din sală a fost mai uh, proactivă. Acum, ce urmează după bull din big? I, păi hai să facem un I, așa, uite, așa. Excelent, excelent. Să, dacă se aud sunete de oase în sală, să știți că e vorba de exercițiu cu antrenamentul de care spunea uh, colegul de acolo. Mulțumesc! Și cum facem gâul atunci? E, eh, așa? Și poate pentru cine am mâncat micul dejun putem să încercăm și această mișcare. Bun, și mai facem o singură dată dacă e să încercăm toată sala. Deci suntem la big, b, hai să facem și eu, excelent, și hai să facem și gâul, cum vreți voi, într-o parte sau în alta. Vă mulțumesc frumos pentru rezistență și exercițiile de antrenament. Și o rândă de aplauze pentru voi, dacă vreți, desigur. Bine, dragilor, păi hai să trecem și la treburile mai uh, serioase, ca să spun așa, ale conferinței. Uh, sunt dator să vă dau câteva informații de natură organizatorică pentru această conferință. Uh, cum spuneam, Bucharest Integrity Gathering. Avem, bineînțeles, și uh, niște organizații care se ocupă de implementarea acestei conferințe. Este vorba de Fundvertising și liderii de mâine București. Alături de mai mulți parteneri, și o să vă rog să-mi dați voie să-i citesc, nu sunt foarte mulți, dar cât sunt un pic de răbdare ca să-i auzim, Mulțumiri speciale pentru Ambasada Statelor Unite, mulțumiri speciale pentru ISEC, Alpha Bank, Raiffeisen Bank, Nestle, EMAG, Editura Publica, Self Trust Academy și, bineînțeles, nu în ultimul rând, mulțumiri pentru sprijinul logistic uh, din partea teatrului Odeon. Oamenii care vă ajută la intrare, alături de ISEC și alte organizații, mai vin și de la Brigada de Voluntari, bineînțeles, cu un rând de mulțumiri merg și către uh, ei. Mai avem, bineînțeles, mai multe surprize de-a lungul zilei, dar e bine să vă spunem de la început că există și o mică miză. Avem și niște premii din partea partenerilor EMAG și Editura Publica și la momentul potrivit o să vedeți și care este uh, competiția. E legat, să spunem așa, de calitatea întrebărilor sau întrebările interesante pe care voi o să le adresați uh, invitațiilor de pe scenă. Poate un ultim gând despre agenda. Există în această zi trei părți mari, distincte. Prima parte, până aproximativ în jurul orei 12.30,
O să avem și o pauză de prânz și ne putem bucura de, de mâncare aproximativ o oră, până în jurul orei 1 jumate, 1.45. Uh, după masă există un calup între uh, finalul mesei de prânz și aproximativ ora 3 și jumătate. Vă spun aproximativ că depinde un pic și de dinamica uh, din sală. Iar conferința, în mod normal, se va termina pe la 11 noaptea, dacă nu aveți planuri pentru de seară. Glumesc. Aproximativ ora 17.30 este finalul de, de zi. Sunt mulți invitați, sper să vă placă, sunt multe povești interesante despre valori și despre integritate și în curând chiar va trebui să-mi taie cineva microfonul pentru că e timpul să dăm uh, uh, rândul primului invitat. Okay. Da, oare suntem pregătiți? Da, să cam băut eu. Păi hai să dăm o rundă de aplauze atunci. Excelent, foarte bine. Bine, dragilor, este momentul să vă introduc și de altfel pentru invitații care vin din alte țări, o să fac și o scurtă introducere în limba engleză. Este momentul să vă să invităm în scenă alături de noi primul invitat din această conferință. Și uh, să știți că e un invitat special care vine de departe și vine cu multă experiență în spate. Vine de la o companie renumită și o să ne împărtășească alături de povești și experiența uh, lui de viață. Așa că uh, we are more than happy to uh, have you uh, with all of us today. Steve Simpson, engineering manager with Procter and Gamble Global United States. So please welcome on the scene, Steve. Thank you. It's a great privilege to be with you. Um, I come from Cincinnati, Ohio, in the U.S. Pardon me for speaking English only. I have been here one day, and I have not yet mastered Romanian. But I'm still working on English, so hopefully you can follow my English. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I am married, and in fact, in three weeks, I will celebrate my 40th wedding anniversary. Uh, I know you're wondering about that. I got married at 10 years old, in case you're, <laughs> you're wondering. Uh, I have three adult children who are all married, and they have produced for me 14 grandchildren. So they've been quite busy. <laughs> Today, my oldest is 38, and yesterday, my youngest is 32. Uh, I have lived in Cincinnati most of my life, except for moves with Procter and Gamble. I've lived in several other locations. I lived in two other states, and I lived in Japan for a while. And uh, I have been, I was with Procter and Gamble for 33 years. I'm now retired. So they don't pay me anymore. I'm here on my own. Uh, I'm going to share a story with you today about some experience that I have with P&G, and later I will tell you the end of the story, so you have to stay around to hear the end. Uh, my colleague, Todd Geist, will be with me and we will present at the end. And what we're presenting are principles of leadership and teamwork. But what I want to do this morning for a brief time is to give you some background on how I came to understand this issue of teamwork and how it made such a big difference in Procter & Gamble. I'm actually an electrical engineer by education. I hired in to uh, P&G in 1974, and I was in the engineering division, and most of my first years with the company, I was doing electrical engineering work. I was a controls engineer, which meant I make lines run that produce products. And so there's lots of computer control, industrial controls. And for about the first half of my career, I did technical engineering work. And then, after a time, I expanded into other things, more broad. Uh, I focused on overall improvement of not only processes, but improvement of quality, cost, reliability, throughput. A lot of things just to make our, co our products better and cheaper and, and uh, you know, more appealing to the consumer. Now, I, how many of you have heard of Procter & Gamble? Okay. How many of you know how many brands Procter & Gamble makes? <laughs> uh, I don't know exactly because they keep changing, but it's approximately 300. 
And uh, you probably use some of them and may not even know you're using a P&G brand. Uh, one of the brands I want to talk about today is one you probably do know, uh, although not many of you have children, but you've probably heard of Pampers. <laughs> have you heard of Pampers? Okay. I worked in the diaper business for many years, and um, it's quite a complicated business. Uh, diaper uh, production lines make diapers really fast, uh, so fast that you can't see them. Uh, they come off the line at a rate that you, your, your eyes cannot follow uh, the speed. And uh, as an engineer, I, I had a lot of uh, work to do with controls trying to make them go faster and better and so on. And um, every, every time we, uh, as engineers, tried to make an improvement to, to improve the capacity or the reliability or the, the rate of our lines, we never seemed to achieve what we wanted to achieve. If we were trying to make a 5% improvement in throughput, we might get one or two, and it was always a frustrating thing because we never quite understood why we didn't get the effect we were hoping for. In 1990, the director of manufacturing for the diaper business came to the engineers, and he said that he wanted to increase the throughput of the diaper business by 25% in the next three months. Should I dance to that? <laughs> and uh, actually, we all started laughing. We said, <laughs> there's no way you can increase the diaper throughput by 25% in three months. It's never been done. We don't know how to do it. And we never seem to succeed in even getting 5%. So no, we can't do that. <laughs> and so he, he came to me and he challenged me. He says, well, what would you do if I told you you had to do that? What would be your plan? I said, well, I need to study it a lot, and uh, I want a team of resources to do that, and I need to go live in a plant for a while to figure this out. He says, go, do it. You'll get anybody you want. We'll give you a company plane if you want, but go to a location and spend time, and he asked me how much time, and I said, I have no idea, but I'm betting it's going to take at least a month to study this. So I took a bunch of engineers to a production plant, and um, as typical engineers would be, we would start working on equipment problems, trying to figure out what doesn't work right, where are the failures, and uh, why does the machine break down. But having had a lot of experience in realizing we never make progress that way, I said, there's something else to this. And let's take off our engineering hats, and let's look, take a comprehensive approach. Let's look at all the systems. Let's study the people. Let's study the infrastructure. Let's study the support systems. How are they organized? How do they communicate? How do they make decisions? Where are the storerooms and, and how do they work? Where's the, what's the quality system like? Are we trying to be too tight on our quality standards so that it, it inhibits our progress? So out of the team of engineers, I had about 12 with me. I assigned only two to look at equipment problems. I said, yeah, dig into the data, try to figure out you know, why we can't run better and find the biggest sources of problems. But I had a lot of skepticism whether that would produce anything that we didn't already know. The rest of us divided up, and we each took on some system to try to understand better. While they were all studying, all these different structures and formats and processes and procedures, I decided I wanted to dig into the people that ran the lines. What is, what is it about the people that makes a difference? Now, let me describe a diaper operation. They're long production lines. They're like 150 feet long and full of huge machinery, and they run very fast. And they're quite complicated, thousands and thousands of moving parts, moving very fast. And uh, there are teams uh, that run these lines. For every two lines, there's a team of 12 people that run them. And in this particular operation, we had a total of 24 teams so that we could run 
three shifts a day, seven days a week. Now, just so you have a perspective on the diaper business, the, the diaper business in Procter & Gamble is at about a $9 billion business. It's a Fortune 100 company all by itself. And that's just a division of P&G. And so it's a big deal. And we have diaper plants all over the world. So if we can make progress on this, it's worth millions. 25% improvement in capacity is millions and millions of dollars. And so it's an important problem. Well, as we started looking at the people, I, uh, I asked the simple question, show me the data of how each team produces, all these 24 teams. I want to know how they individually work. And they told me, we don't collect that data. I said, you're kidding. You don't know what an individual team does? How could that be? I said, well, we have a culture here where we don't want to uh, impose negative competition. We want everybody to feel good about each other, and so we just collect all their results together, and we do the bottom line. And so as a whole team, we are producing a result. I said, well, that's a nice, noble gesture. Unfortunately, there may be some, something that we can learn from an individual team, because my suspicion is there's a lot of variation here, and it would help to know what that is. So it turns out that there was one low-level manager who secretly had been collecting this data all along. And it was in a file, and uh, he, he made me swear that I would never share the data if he gave me the file. I said, sure, I'm not going to share that data except to the whole world. But uh, I took all the data on a team by team out of these 24 teams, and I did a statistical analysis on it. And I was shocked when I learned that individual teams, you know, it's not shocking to find out that they vary in their performance. What was shocking is how much they vary. And in fact, there were several teams in the module that were operating at a 25% higher capacity already. My first conclusion is we can stop working on everything else. If one team or two teams can operate at this higher rate, what are we working on? And what is it about those teams that makes them different than other teams? I did this statistical analysis to determine, is this a fluke? Is this something that's uh, unusual? And I did six months worth of data, and no, it was statistically significant that several teams consistently produced much higher. And the normal distribution showed that up to the upper side, we were already achieving the goal that we were seeking. And the other side, we weren't. So um, we started to study this then. And I picked one pair of lines that had the two best teams. There were four teams assigned to that. Let's call them A, B, C, and D. A and C on that equipment had average, maybe even below average results. And results look like how many cases they produced per day, what their quality looked like, how fast they ran the line, and so on. Teams B and D were the ones that were 25% higher on the same days, on the same equipment, over the same period of time. So it wasn't the sun that was causing these differences. <laughs> it wasn't the equipment that was causing the difference. It wasn't the management that was causing the difference. It was the team. And this was such a breakthrough to see this, and nobody had, for some reason, in the years of history of Procter & Gamble, they had never seen that clear of a distinction. So, okay, we need to understand that. So, we uh, picked out some of the best teams and some of the average teams and some of the worst teams, and we conducted, at first, interviews. And we were trying to find out what makes you so good. And when we would sit with some of the best teams, they would talk about how well they work together. And they would talk about how they have such superior skills and how they uh, liked each other and, and how uh, they knew what they were doing. You know, nobody else knows what they're doing but us. You know, and they had a lot of pride. And there were cer certain factors that we were hearing in their conversation. 
And we would ask them, uh, well, what are you upset about? What, what bothers you? And they would say, well, what bothers us when, is when they group us with all those other people who don't get such good results. And in fact, there had been an injury on one of the lines, and uh, injuries are a bad thing, and, and normally you're violating some kind of uh, operating procedure if you have an injury. And, and when they do, they tend to just retrain everybody. Say, okay, we had an injury, let's retrain everybody. But the best team in the module had 11-year safety record with zero injuries. Can you imagine how you feel when they say, we need to retrain you on safety, even though you have a perfect record? It's very demotivating. And in all of our conversations, when we ask them what, would, what would make them a better team and how would they improve the results, never one time did they say, if you could just fix the equipment. Never. That wasn't their issue. It, says, it wasn't until we asked a direct question and said, if there was something on the equipment that we could help you with, what would it be? He said, oh, well, fix that thing. You know, That gives us problems. But that wasn't where their focus was. And all the years we had been working as engineers to work on equipment. That wasn't the source of their irritation. When we got done with the interviews, we were just so amazed by what we heard about the effective teams. We said, in this lies the secret for the diaper business as a whole to achieve its objective. There's no way a bunch of engineers are going to get us there. But there is a way that these teams will. And the principles that we sucked out of these interviews, we decided to categorize them into a model, a simple model, which I'm going to share with you later. I'm not going to give you all the details because I need you to come back. So we took some of these simple principles out and we created a tool, a test, a, a, an organizational health assessment that ask questions of all the teams and that would try to assess how they rated in all these particular parameters of what makes a good team. It turned out to be an excellent tool because when we got done, we, we gave this to every person in that particular module of lines, 12 production lines, 24 teams, as we analyzed the data that came out of this test, by their own answers, we were able to correlate their responses to their actual results. Statistically significant. Good responses, good results. Bad responses, bad results. Direct correlation. They were self-analyzing how good they were as a team. That was, that was amazing to us. It was so clear that that we said, nobody's going to believe this. <laughs> we thought nobody would believe our results. So when we finally concluded after one month of doing all the work that we could to understand how to get this 25% improvement, we said, we need to share this uh, data. And some of the data that we need to share is that teams operate differently when Training systems look better, when skills look better, when some obvious things, but there were some non-obvious things also that made it better. And we thought nobody will believe it, so we invited all the plant managers from the other plants and the operations manager, which is a level down, we brought in about 30 people to this one plant for a day. And we decided instead of giving them a presentation on our learnings, we were going to consolidate a month's worth of study into a day's worth of study, and we created a study plan for them to do the study themselves. And so they spent a whole day interviewing people, looking at equipment, walking to the storeroom, checking all the comprehensive approach. We didn't leave out anything that we had looked at because we wanted them to get the whole picture like we had so that they would come to their own conclusion. At the end of the day, without prompting them, without telling them what we came up with, we said, what did you learn today? What is the most impactful thing that you think we can do to improve our team effectiveness or our, our results, getting the 25% improvement? And they said, it's all about teams. It's all about the people. And we said, we're glad you figured that out. That's what we figured out, too. And then we shared the details of our study. 
We share details of how um, we have one team that had the most skills and another team that had the least skills. And believe it or not, you would think that they would be the best and the worst, but actually the one with the least skills was the top team in the module. Why was that? I'm going to answer that later. The one with the best skills was the second best team. And what was interesting about that dynamic, they were both on the same line, and the one with the least skills, which had two years average experience, and the one with the best skills had 11 years average experience, the two-year team looked up to the and admired the 11-year team, thinking someday we want to be like that. But nobody knew they were better. They actually were. And out of this, we developed a model that said, not only do we identify what are the key characteristics of what makes a good team, but we developed a saying or a, 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 a motto because what we, what we were able to see was it has that the people, the impact of the team was so great that we believe that in any improvement effort we would want to make, probably 70% of your gain is going to be focusing on the people and 30% on other things like equipment, processes, systems, infrastructure, and so on. And if we're wrong about that, it's going to be more 80 or 90% people. It's not going to be less. Now, remember what I said in the beginning, that we would try to make a 5% improvement, we would get one or two? Well, what's 30% of 5%? It's one or two. We were focused on that other stuff, equipment, procedures, and so on, but not on the people. We neglected the team component of it. And it became so clear why for years we hadn't gotten the result we wanted. That motto of 30, 70, 30 went around the world in PNG. And out of this, all the plant managers went back to their individual plants and all they focused on was team development. And we had a model for them to start with. With these principles we're going to share later, we said, there's a simple way to approach this. You look at these few things, and if you focus on these few things, we're going to get the results. And yes, we'll continue to work on equipment problems. Yes, we'll try to continue to improve systems, infrastructure, all of that. It's all important. We call it continuous improvement. We're constantly in a mode of trying to improve everything. But if you're not focusing on the team, you're not going to get there. To end that story, when they got focusing that way, uh, we achieved the 25% improvement in about six months around the world. First time ever in the history of the business that we had con that kind of impact. Now, you all have some experience with the team. You probably observe teams, you know, one of the team, you may be too young to remember this, but you've probably seen it in history. I think of uh, one of the Olympics where the U.S. hockey team beat the Russian hockey team, said to be impossible. They were actually an inferior team, the U.S. hockey team was. And for the first time ever, they won the gold medal. And everyone was trying to figure out why. As I look at the model that we developed, I think I know. I think there's secrets in there. And in fact, what I have noticed over time, and that was just 25 years ago we studied this, consistently over and over, I've been able to look at team dynamics from sports to work to whatever, and being able to articulate what is the missing element that's not making this team work well? What are the elements there that are working well. I recently did this presentation for a manufacturing company, and when I got done, I had two responses in the room. One response was somebody says, no wonder we can't get anything done on our team. We're totally missing this. And another one said, yes, I got the best team ever, and now I know why. <laughs> and it really helped them to articulate what they needed to go work on. We recently saw a baseball trade in the US about two years ago actually where a team on the west coast professional baseball uh, had two really really good players on that team highly paid best players on the team best players in the league and we had a team on the east coast that was losing a lot 
So the, uh, the losing team gathered up all their spare change and decided to buy the two players from the best team on the West Coast. So they traded them over, paid them more than anybody's ever been paid before in baseball. And of course the expectation is the losing team will begin to win and the winning team will probably flatten out, maybe lose. What do you think happened? Nothing? Okay. Actually, what happened was the winning team won more. The losing team lost more. There was an element missing. I'm going to share that element later. <laughs> but it was another dynamic of where if you try to fix the problem by methods that you think are obvious, they may not be so obvious. And actually what happened in the team dynamic of those teams played out in that the team that lost their best players did better and the team that gained the best players did worse. Just another example of how if you don't understand what are the principles that really make it work. And the beauty is that what I'm going to share later is very simple and obvious. And I hope you go away saying, well, that was pretty obvious, kind of a no-brainer, except we never thought of it until we did this study, until we articulated it in a way that said, this is clear, simple. Now, there are a lot of models out there and a lot of books written on teams, and they're all good, and they'll have 25 different things that make a team better, but I'm going to share with four things, uh, and that's all the four that we're going to discuss later when Todd gets here and we put it in the context of leadership because leadership is one of those things that's pretty important. As I progressed in my career then beyond that time, that study, my job started to change into more consulting within the company to where I was helping plants get better results around the world. I visited 44 of our plants all over the world and the more I learned and the older I got, the more I realized Again, it's about people. And connecting this to the issue of integrity, when we look at that team dynamic, you're going to see there's a theme in there. Because part of the importance of the action of a team and the, the ability of a team to be effective has to do with integrity and trust, respect, all the things that people crave and desire. And without that, teams fall apart. So... That's pretty much my story. That's the intro to what I want to share later. Um, it, was, it was such an impactful uh, experience for me that uh, even in my daily life when I work with, I sometimes consult with small companies, or even when I serve on a board at church or uh, a board in a community thing, this dynamic comes back every time. And each time something's not working, I go back to the same model and say, I know what's wrong. And if we fix this, we will improve our results. So that's what I have to share in my intro. And if you have questions, come back for the afternoon <laughs> session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve.